Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I think we are going to have an extremely exciting and intense session today. Uh, we are all struggling with leadership and it's even more important in this period of time where we are facing innovation, uncertainty. And as we saw during the first series of masterclass uh, earlier this year, that certainly we are shifting our leadership model from something very much directed from the brain to something encompassing more the heart. And it was the, the main conclusion I remember of the, the masterclass number four last year. So let's be tuned like that and behind heart, certainly the word care is very important and not speaking more. I would like, in addition to thanks a lot, BCG, Fanny, Marie, to be with to to be in partnership with us to to for this masterclass is extremely important. So, a warm thanks to to all of you. And I pass the floor to you, Fanny. Thank you very much, Claude. So it's a very uh, real pleasure to be back with you guys. And uh, as Claude was saying, it's a masterclass on leadership number five even though we've rebooted and started again with number one. Uh, thank you very much to the French INSEAD Alumni Association for inviting us and, and also on, on the other side of the partnership uh, for partnering with BCG on, on those ma masterclass about leadership. Uh, and I thank you very much, Claude, as well, as uh, the head of career management for the association for hosting us today. So <clears throat> we're going to have a very uh, uh, interesting uh, discussion today, which uh, we hope will uh, help all of us go smoothly into the end of the year vacation. Uh, I did this for you. Ah. <laughs> Can you please uh, keep your mic off? if you please. Uh, so people want hearts, the planet needs humanity. That's the topic for today. I'm Fanny Potier. I'm 2001 in SEAD MBA. I have a long experience in people uh, strategy topic. And I, I'm a deep believer that the human factor is at the heart of innovation, agility, and sustainable organizations. Um, I'm going to uh, start this presentation with uh, a, a slight change of process compared to last year. And I will start with, we have a super panel with Marie Amblofero, Mathilde Ben and Rasmus Ugard. I'm going to start introducing Rasmus. Um, he's the founder and the CEO of Potential Project. He's the author of groundbreaking and best-selling book by Harvard Business Review, uh, Press, sorry, the, you may have read already The Mind of the Leader. Rasmus uh, is just about to publish another one, uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Rasmus is nominated by Thinkers 50 as one of the eight most important leadership thinkers in the world today. He writes for Avas Business Review, as I said, for Forbes and for Business Insider. He's a sought after keynote speaker and leadership developer who coaches and supports C-suite executives as global organizations such as IKEA, Accenture, Walmart, and others. Um, Rasmus' new book, as I was saying, Compassionate Leadership, How to Do the Hard Thing in the Human Way, will be coming out on January 18, 2022. It's a powerful and practical guide to doing the hard work of leadership in a human way. And Rasmus will tell us a little bit about that. Without um, further ado, and before we move into a more rational part of the discussion, I'm going to pass the baton to Rasmus, who will guide us on a short meditation to get us ready to talk about the heart and uh, caring for the planet. Thank you, Rasmus. Wonderful, Fanny. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. A pleasure to meet you on this beautiful Thursday morning, just before Christmas. So yes, we'd like to invite you to just join on a few moments of settling practice, just so that we can all get really present here together. And the first thing I'll invite you is just to close your eyes for these few minutes. And to bring awareness into your body and just notice what does it feel like to be you right now? What does your body feel like in this moment? And 
I'll try and bring a bit of awareness. And whatever you're coming from this morning, I'll invite you to just let go of that. And to help you do that, you can bring a bit of attention to the out breath. And as you're breathing out, deliberately let go of anything you're coming from. So that you can bring more attention, more presence, more focus into the time that we have together this morning. And then as we are about to start, take one moment just to consider why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of today? And what do you need to do to get the most out of your experience this morning? And with that, I'll invite you all to Open eyes again, come back to this room and I'll hand it back over to Fanny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rasmus. <laughs> I'm certainly very happy to be here this morning uh, to have this discussion with you, Mathilde and Marie. Um, without uh, further ado, um, let me just start with a, a couple of um, uh, logistical points, um, which, uh, sorry, I'm trying, okay. So as, as Rasmus invited you, this is a session for you. And um, we will have two moments in this session. First of all, a panel discussion, as I was mentioning before. And then as we did the, the previous times, we'll uh, move into breakouts so that there is a chance to discuss amongst us on some of the insights and learnings that uh, have been uh, brought by the panelists. Um, if you can keep your mics off, uh, when we move into the breakout, we would really welcome having the camera on. Uh, the session is recorded, so I just want that to be very explicit to uh, each one of you. Um, without uh, more uh, weight around this uh, introduction of the panel, let me, uh, so I've introduced Rasmus already, let me introduce um, warmly Mathilde de Ben. Mathilde is the founder of Planet Wake Me Up. Mathilde has started her career at BCG and then she moved to Parfum Christian Dior in marketing. In 2017, she read Cyril Dion's book, Demain, and, decide, and decided to be part of the solution around climate issues. She created Planet Wake Me Up with the desire to support organizations in their ecological transition, tapping into the creativity of their people. In 2020, she also founded Ozac de Citoyen to raise awareness in the general public around climate change. She's graduated from uh, HEC and she's an executive coach. And we are very pleased to have her today. Marie, uh, you, you, some of you have already met her. She's a managing director and partner at BCG. She's leading BCG People Strategy for Western Europe region. And she's also a core member of the healthcare and operation practice. Since joining BCG in 2007, Marie has developed two passions in her professional career, biopharma and people. She has deep expertise in biopharma and notably the vaccine industry, and she has supported many leaders in their development strategy and digital transformation, amongst other things. On the people side, she's convinced that company transformation have to rely on their people and be fully people-centric. Thank you, Mary, for being there this morning as well. And uh, as I was uh, telling you before, so uh, the new book from Rasmus is coming out uh, January, I think January 18, and it's called Compassionate Leadership. I think uh, Rasmus, you will share a little bit of, of those uh, insights um, in, in the panel. Uh, Rasmus has uh, uh, kindly offered 
us 25% uh, promo on the price of the book and you can uh, take the code here and we put it in the chat uh, if you're interested. You just need to go on the website uh, of HBR and then you just enter the promo code. I'm going to start, uh, sorry, I'm going to start uh, Marie with uh, you. And um, I just wanted to um, ask you, if we look back these past two years, what have we learned in terms of caring for self, for the others and for the planet? So thank you, Fanny, and I'm uh, really thrilled to be, to be here with you uh, today to discuss about this topic, about caring caring for people, caring for others, caring for, for, for the planet. And as you, you say, Fanny, looking back at these past two years, we can see it's been very intense. It was already intense for a lot of leaders before that, with the speed of change, the speed of technology, the rate of innovation, but it's been even more pressing since the, the past two years with the, with, the, with the COVID pandemic. And what has changed? In fact, I can think about at least two things. One, the risk for, um, for climate and the risk for our planet. It's become a pressing necessity to care for the planet. And when we look just outside uh, at what we see, in fact, every other day, every other week, we see our planet reminding us that we are too much taking out of it. There is no week without a climate event, and climate events are even greater than what it was, uh, was before. And hence, every leader now is probably aware that they need to act. We are out of the, almost out of the COP26 a few weeks back. And even if some of us may think it was not sufficient and it was not to the, to the stakes that where it needs to be, we can still see that companies have taken that challenge willingly and they have all now decided to take action upon that. It's a complex road ahead of us, but caring for the planet, I feel, in the, all the client conversations I have uh, since now a few months, a few years, uh, it is really, really present. The second thing is caring for our people and not just being empathetic or not just developing our people. There are rising calls for equity and justice is much stronger than what it was before. And caring for our people, making them thrive, uh, giving them their ability to be their best selves, both outside of work and within work, it's a necessity, is key for the success of our, our company. And like planet is becoming a scarce resource, our people and our talent are also scarce. We've been talking since years about war for talent and COVID has crystallized much even much more that war for talent you've probably seen in the us starting a mass resignation that has huge impact and that is that is becoming also um true for for us in um in, in europe in some of the studies that we've done we see that half of the people are actually openly looking for external opportunities uh, so this is becoming a reality so caring for the planet caring for our people there is a third element, if I may, which is technology. I mean, just the call that we're having today. A few years back, we would have certainly have that in an auditorium. We would be physically present all together having that type of discussion. Our new normal is going to be this hybrid work where it creates also a necessity to be more self-aware. And I thank Rasmus for, for the meditation we just had a few minutes back to be fully present, even if we're on our own each of us in our single room. We need to be fully present, fully in interaction, leveraging the technology to our advantage, not the opposite, which is clearly also something that is new and, and we need to adapt to that. What, what I would say also is how as leader we could react to that. And we've been using with, uh, with, with Fanny this framework around head, heart and hands, around what needs to be done across these three levers. And as Claude was mentioning, uh, we can see in our research that people are always even more looking for heart. 
it's almost 40% of people that are asking and pressing their leaders to, to display these, uh, these hard qualities. And uh, what we've seen also in our research is that leadership is entering in a new area. And to cope with the challenges that leaders have, instead of trying to extract as much as possible of the resources that they have, both from the planet, from the people, from the ecosystem, they would need to shift gears somehow and try to generate positive impact in in, instead of extracting. And this is what we call being generative leaders and what it means if i try to to lay down just a few examples across the head heart and hands that means that for the head it's not just about strategic thinking it's about reinvention reinventing our products our services our business model for the service also of the planet and of all of us for the heart it's enriching the human experience really caring for and supporting uh, our employees not just being in a transactional mode but really genuine care and genuine appreciation of the employees and they would give you back much more and for the hands it's not just simple execution but it's really being agile in the way we do things. It's developing our teams to move quickly together. I've also a lot of discussions with my, my clients on how, how to remove the roadblocks, this bureaucracy we've been talking about for years. How do we leverage technology also wisely to, to help and support that change and to augment the human, the human being. So really, Claude introduced that session with that word care and i feel it's a word that is will be in the head or needs to be in the head of our our leaders for for the long run and caring for the whole ecosystem uh, to be able to to cope with everything that's coming thank you marie i think it's a, it's a good uh, <laughs> passage de baton to rasmus so rasmus your upcom upcoming book compassionate leadership how to do the hard things in a human way talks about the increasing need to feel connected, valued, cared for, and cared about in the, work, in the workplace. Why do we think we need caring for self and others now more than ever? And why do leaders have the responsibility to create this experience? Well, thank you, uh, Fanny. That's a, that's a good question that I guess most people on, the, on this call could already answer, but let, let me just put up the the three big reasons that I think we're all aware of with a, with a pandemic that has led to hybrid, that has led to the great attrition or the re great retention that people are just leaving companies. There are just all reasons why we need to, of course, care for ourselves because work has become harder, but also to care for the people that we're leading. Uh, Microsoft did a big study finding that we are spending an average of 24% more time in meetings and receiving an average of 32% more emails. There are no boundaries anymore because we're working from home. There are no time boundaries, there are no space boundaries. So work is harder, period. And on top of that comes the whole uncertainty. Will I get sick? Will I lose my job? All the changes that are happening. And Marie, thank you for bringing up the climate. I mean, the far distant future of that is also scary. What is that going to do? So people are generally suffering more, being more concerned, being more worried, having more anxiety, probably than ever before, or at least in, in the past many decades. So there is a real need for leaders to step up and step up to this challenge and really have a strong care first for themselves so that they can care for others. So putting on the oxygen mask first, making sure we get enough sleep and all these things so that we can be a really good people leader. So it's very important now, but honestly, it's always been important. I just think that before COVID, we forgot to not think about that. We thought, hey, if we can just push a little bit more performance out of our people, things would be good. But that's a wrong way of thinking. I mean, we all know that morally, ethically, if you as a leader think that it's about pushing more performance and productivity, think about, when your kids enter the workforce, how would you want their leaders to act? That's how we should act as leaders, period. So we are very, um, we are very research focused in, in potential projects. And, 
And, and, and, and one study we did found that the biggest cause of employees' well-being, health, is their leader. And we know for so many studies that employees don't leave workplaces and jobs, but they leave leaders. A leader is just the most important thing. And so we did a big study with some 35,000 managers and leaders around the world to figure out what does it take to drive good performance? And we realized out of this study that there is one thing that leaders should know, which is we need to balance care with execution. The study very simply found that if you as a leader show up with care, you're going to increase people's job satisfaction, their job well-being, but also their job performance quite significantly. If you show up with a strong drive for execution, you're also going to increase their performance, their job performance, uh, their, their job satisfaction, and so on. But if you both have care and execution, and you're good at balancing those two, you will increase it more than twice than if you just do one of them. So people want to be pushed, but people also want to be cared for. And if you can combine those, it's the real sweet spot of leadership. And I know that sounds in theory easy. And then those of you that are actually managing people would be going, huh, that's difficult. Because there is this false dichotomy that many of us are holding that either I have to be a good person that people like, being sweet, giving people what they like, or I have to be a good leader, either being nice or being hard. But that is a false dichotomy. It doesn't exist in reality. It is very, very possible to have those two and then combine them so you create the best results, more happy people and higher performing people. That's ultimately what the, what the new book is about, how to do this kind of leadership. But I would like to ask just to, to, to all of you out there, if we can just ask you all to put in chat, just to hear your voices as well. For you, why is compassion, compassion important in leadership? Why is it important to care for people? And if you'll just take one minute, just write something in the chat and it can be just one word or it can be a sentence. For those of you that prefer French, you can just write it in French because everybody else probably but me will understand and that's good enough. So please take a moment, write a word or a sentence. Why is compassion important in leadership from your perspective? So Laurent is saying it reduces the ego. That's a really good point, Laurent. When we care for others, we take ourselves a little bit out of the, of the, of the picture and that's just a better thing to do. Just because it's real world, because we're real humans. Uh, Didier, I think that's such a good one. One, one, uh, one executive that we interviewed for the book said that leadership is about unlearning management, like all those techniques and strategies we learned back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and zeros, and just relearn being human. And Claire is writing empathy and authenticity, absolutely. And Antoine creates stronger connections between people, yeah. We are made of emotions, not only thinking. Claude, thank you for that. Okay, I can, I can see here, I am preaching to the converted. All of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I should just shut up and hand the baton back over to, to, uh, to Fanny. So thank you so much for the, for the input so far. We will come back to this question. Thank you, Rasmus. Mathilde, you have founded Planet Wake Me Up to help companies reduce their environmental footprint. How would you define caring for the planet? Yes, I think Marie already uh, shared very, some, some very interesting insights about what caring for the planet means, or, or at least means to me. I think that if we took that expression a few years ago, it could have sounded like almost something sweet, you know, like you do volunteering work to preserve the oceans and nature. But now, I think for the past, well, I say five years, the, the meaning of that expression has changed a lot. And Marie, you told that, and I couldn't agree more. It's an absolute necessity to care for the planet because because we are part of the planet and the planet is not something external versus us we belong to the planet so caring for the planet quite egoistically i would say is caring about our home and make, making sure we still have one a sustainable one for the next uh, coming years 
for our kids also, but also for us, because yes, the effects of climate change are already here and will be, you know, it will be multi multiplying in the next coming years. So first, it's a necessity, but to care for the planet with the adequate solutions, we need to change perspective on, on our human posture within the, the ecosystem, meaning we've come from past centuries where humans are dominating nature, basically. And now we need to switch to a new view, a new perspective where human, we are part of all other human, of all other species, living species, and we are leveling with them. So acknowledging that we are interconnected with all the, the living species on this earth, and we need to make not peace, but we need to, to deal with that, which is Yes, someone mentioned the ego, yes, which is a switch from an ego perspective to a more eco, ecological perspective. So second one, so we need to, to revise, to change the way we, we deal with um, nature. Nature has been, you know, a not limitless resource that we've been, uh, uh, you know, leveraging or using for our own benefits almost freely. And we think we can still do that indefinitely. Unfortunately, we can't. So we need to change from an economy of abundance to an economy of scarcity. So that quite, that's quite hard because it will imply that we, we need to start uh, prioritizing our needs, uh, waste management, etc. It, it, it brings a lot of new ways of doing work just by, by this statement. Uh, and then um, from a more internal perspective, we need to acknowledge that our power as human is much, may, maybe not unlimited and that we need to accept that we have much more limited power with that one we, we thought we, we have. So that's the second uh, key point for me in, in, in order for us to care truly and significantly about the planet. The third point is that it's not, yeah, it's not the planet and us, it's not separated. We are all interconnected. So the, the change that is needed here is the systemic change, implying that every single member of the system, of the ec ecosystem needs to change. So we need to change as individuals, companies need to change, governments need to change the way our cities our territories are organized needs to change international governance needs to change in a globalized world which is which make make it really complex because like the domino theory we all have to change but we don't know how and how we can organize the change of the whole system so to me and that's why i created my company it's possible but we need to assess that it will be long. We created this problem for, you know, it took us two more than uh, almost 300 years to create it. So we won't, it won't take a decade to solve it. Probably it's complex, uh, given the, the intersectionality of all, um, parts in this system and more importantly, and I think more important, more importantly for, for the companies, it's risky. It's very risky because it's unknown. We don't know what the water tomorrow will look like. So the necessary but bold moves are quite risky. But for me, it's more risky not to do something today than starting, you know, inventing um, and also uh, try and fail maybe, but at least we are, we will be moving. So, so yes, it's for me, I still remain optimistic uh, that we can, we all have both an individual and collective responsibility uh, to care for the planet, engage in the journey, and I would say make the impossible possible. Thank you, Mathilde. Uh, coming back to you, Rasmus, how can companies change to instill care and compassion in the workplace? And what is in the spirit of, you know, uh, making small steps, what is a good starting point and how can they sustain this transformation? Mm. I think like any other transformation, it takes time and it needs to be sustained with, with a lot of effort. Um, I think I'll share a few stories, just real stories that came out of our research and our, and our interviews, because stories are always, always interesting. Um, one of the companies and one of the CEOs that really inspired me was the, the CEO of Southwest Airlines. And I'm sorry to bring up an airline here because we're also talking about climate and we know what airlines are doing to that. However, 
their care and their commitment to people is probably one of the strongest that I have seen in any of the companies that we have done research on in the past five years. Um, just those of you that are not aware of Southwest Airlines, it's the fastest growing company on average over the past 50 years. So they're doing very, very strong financially. Their main value within the company is compassion. The founder said compassion is the most important thing for us to be successful. And there's been studies done by sociologists finding that the culture within Southwest is so cohesive that the captain, together with the stewardesses, with the luggage people, everybody's just collaborating in the most agile and effective way because there's that sense of we are in this together. So I talked to him uh, a number of times and a few years ago, he shared one thing that he is always uh, instilled in the organization, a systemic approach to caring for people. And with systemic, it works like this. Next to his office is an office where there's five people sitting and they are registering any incident that happens to any of the employees, some 57,000 people that are employed there. If anybody loses a family member, if any of them have serious illness or is, is experiencing some other kind of serious uh, life incident, they will get to know about that. That information will go across the hallway into Gary's office. He will write a personal handwritten note to that person and basically ask, is there anything we as a company can do to support you? So nobody out of 57,000 people can experience anything significant without getting a message, a personal message delivered from the CEO. The sense of care that people have when they have that kind of extreme top-down attention is just amazing. Another conversation I had with him, which was about a, almost a year into COVID. And as you can imagine, they were bleeding, bleeding, bleeding money every day. They had made a decision to sacrifice shareholders as opposed to employees. So they had decided not to lay off a single employee a year into the pandemic. And as far as I'm aware, they still haven't done that, but rather they are taking debt so that they can keep their employees. And the whole philosophy is if we take care of them, they will take care of the company when planes start to get into the air again. So I think this is just some really strong, big examples of what care and compassion means in a, in a company. Another one that has been equally inspiring to me and also getting into the bigger context of climate as well is IKEA. And I know most people, when they hear IKEA, they think of just another multinational that is just completely ruining the planet. Um, I've been working closely with IKEA, both with their, with their 15,000 uh, managers, but also with their, with their management board and an executive team, and especially with the CEO, Jesper spending probably nine full days with the whole management team. I have never heard him talk about money, but I've heard him at least in six occasions with tears in his eyes, talking about the climate and the refugee crises and what they can do about it. And IKEA has a commitment to in 24, 2024 to be climate positive, meaning not just neutral, but positive. So they're installing, or actually they have done this over the past decade, solar panels over all of their warehouses. Almost all of their warehouses are completely from electricity and heating perspective, self-sustained, or they have wind turbines at, at, at their plants. So they're planning on being positive. The first large multinational company to be positive, they were the, the company even to coin the term of being climate positive. One thing they can do. Another thing is, and I don't, I guess nobody will know this, but IKEA is establishing massive, or have done this for decades, massive, massive refugee camps in the parts of the world where there's a lot of refugees, where global or, or, or international organizations can't come in and support IKEA because they're not bound by politics. They can simply go in and establish these massive, massive camps. And they're right now hosting more than 250,000 refugees around the world where they're paying for the doctors, for the food, for the heating, for everything. So this is just another good example of how companies can really care, not just for employees, but also for the climate and also for humanity. 
And this is one of the most successful financial companies in the world. So it is possible. I think there is hope. Thank you. I hope that answered the question. I took it a little bit bigger as well. Thank you, Rasmus. It certainly did. Uh, Mathilde, to you again. Um, we know that to achieve some of the climate goals, uh, deeply encored behaviors need to change, as you mentioned. And I think some examples of Rasmus were going in that direction. Change is hard. And as human beings, we value loss and are quite uh, limited in our appreciation of uncertain gains. What can we do about that? Well, we can, yes, we have a lot to do. So if I had to sum up what we, the, the, what we need to do is um, we need to detox from fossil fuels energy. We need to detox from an unlimited uh, source of, uh, of uh, energy available for us. And let's not forget that energy and GDP are strongly correlated. So we need to go to rehab. We need to learn everything back again. We need to change the way we think, the way we manage, the way we act. We need to modify deeply, uh, you know, strong, old anchored beliefs we have about, you know, maybe growth, um, unlimited progress. We need to change all that. It's I'm not the first to say that. And I want to I wanted to share with you this morning two quotes uh, from uh, Albert Einstein, at least we, we, we think he told that. The first one is that insanity is to behave in the same way and expect a different result. If we think about our business the same way we used to, it will probably lead us to the same results. So we need to re-envision, to invent the way we do business. Then the second quote is the important problems we experience, and to me, climate change and biodiversity loss, etc., all and all its consequences are huge problems. These kind of problems cannot be solved on the plane of thought that were where, where they were created. So it means we need to change our internal software. So the change required is not slight adjustment. It's a massive, it's a complete turnaround of our behavior. So first, and for me, the first point is that it to acknowledge, to accept that we have to do that. And acceptance, if we go back to the, 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 the curve of loss, the acceptance is the fifth step and the last one into the, the, the curve of loss. So we need to go through all the steps, basically. So we are, if you look around you, probably you have people who are still in the de denial phase, probably people that are very angry, people that are trying to bargain. OK, if I eat a little bit less meat, can I still take the plane, uh, etc. We are we are all dealing with that and that's perfectly OK. It will lead us to the fifth phase, which is acceptance. And I think the, the, the one uh, people we can look after is the younger generations. They, they are, they've already understood that they have all the choice but to change and they are pushing us sometimes quite not, not, not in very subtle and gentle way, but younger generation, they, they need us to change and they are urging us to do so. <clears throat> so maybe we can partner with them and see how it, how it goes. Um, so yes, so change, of course, and I think as a coach, I know that and Rasmus, you probably um, met a lot of people that and, and for maybe you, even you, we experience in personal transformation, we know that change is hard, it's long, it's uncomfortable, unpredictable, and risky. But once we go on that kind of journey, generally, we see that the payoffs are higher than we expected, but we don't know what they will be, what they will be. Um, and for me as a coach, and that's why I chose to address this kind of issues through coaching, in turn, personal coaching up to the organizational coaching, is that we all have the resources in us or around us already, but we just don't know that yet, or we don't know how to mobilize them in the right way. So for me, as a lot of people see that it's it's very scary that the, the, the 10 years that are uh, you know coming ahead of us, for me, it's the greatest opportunity that we will have in or will we'll have in decades to reinvent a, a new paradigm, a new society. We need to mobilize our creativity, innovation capabilities and how we can do that 
we can do that by mobilizing our neocortex, which is the smallest part of our brain, 3% in weight, but that make what that works makes us different from the other um, uh, living species. And in this part of our brain, located just behind your forehead, is where our creativity capabilities are, our capacity to nuance, to be you know, to, to revise a judgment, to take some uh, some distance. And that's, you know, in neuroscience, that's where we need, that's the, the part of our brain we need to tackle and put, uh, uh, put on, on the pilot seat to, to create something new. So back to the action, action plan, what can we do? We can, we can act at different levels. First, the individual levels. Maybe you're already doing a lot of stuff uh, and experiencing the difficulties of changing our habits, uh, of our consumption habits. So if I had two advice, it's first, it's, we need to go step by step. We cannot change radically from one day to the other. So we need to experience and see how what works for us. So the second, for me, key learning from the past years, it's we cannot achieve that alone. It's very interesting what is happening right now within companies about collective of uh, people, of, collab of employees gathering to make change happen from the inside so that's true for the for, for the workspace that's true outside of it also so communities uh, people sharing the same values the same interests interest facing the same difficulties gathering for me is another key of success <clears throat> so this is more on the individual level and of course we are here to talk about leadership so the change we need to embrace it's at the co corporations level so we need to reinvent business models very easy to say, very hard to do. We cannot, again, we cannot shift it in one day, but that's crucial. And maybe we can, we can, you know, revisit uh, your vision, your values by saying, what if, what if tomorrow we cannot take planes to, to, to do business meeting, to visit our different, different factories or business units around the world? What, do we, what if we need to, to, to do some resource management? And with what ifs, maybe we can start projecting ourselves and inventing something new based on constraints. We know that innovation comes from constraints. So take, taking into account those constraints can lead us to invent something completely different and create business opportunities at the same time. So for me, this and this is how I help my client move on with this. So reinvent with what if. What if. Reinvent leadership, Erasmus, and I will not, you know, uh, say the same thing that you, you told us. Compassionate leadership, of course, generative leadership, of course, we need to change the way we, we act as leader, of course. And for me, the, 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 the companies, the model I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, to experience right now is the model of what I call the ecological company, a company where um, uh, the vision is, is aligned with the values and the values of every single level within the organization, not just the top management, a company uh, which encourages the expression of whole human potential, as you mentioned, Fanny and Marie, maximizes collective intelligence. If this, this is for me the, the, the biggest challenge where uh, intelligence, um, collective intelligence should be mobilized and, you know, uh, leading at the forefront. And then, of course, a company that not not just does its part, but more than its part on, on the social and environmental issues. So again, very easy to say, I know this trans transformational journey is long and hard, but we have examples of things moving and moving quickly. So that brings me hope. And so if I had to sum up, dream big, <clears throat> start small, but now do not wait for it, I just saw a report uh, from INSEAD uh, yesterday that say that, yeah, leaders are really aware that they need to act, but a majority of it still haven't started yet. So I think it's very interesting. We need to start acting, even if it's small, engage your employees, all the potential is here, leverage collective intelligence as never before and go fast, make sustainability your corporate strategy and the rest will follow, I hope. Thank you, Mathilde. Very uh, uh, hopeful messages. And I think uh, I, I may add from the discussion we had to prepare, you, you had an interesting metaphor about uh, cathedral builders. So I, I think just to say your words, it's a pivoting moment when 
we have to, to reinvent completely. This is a big opportunity, but we have to be humble about that, uh, that you were saying it's going to take time, but uh, um, no, no other choice than doing it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Marie, maybe before we move into breakouts, can you uh, perhaps um, share a few closing words and then uh, I'll kick off the breakouts. Yes, with pleasure. And I, I want to give you two quotes about Mathilde and Rasmus to, to go uh, to the breakouts and go home with. Mathilde, you said, caring for the planet is a necessity. Make sure we have a home in the next coming years. I think that this is something we need to keep in, in our mind because uh, uh, whenever we're facing a big challenge, we need a home, right? So be humble about that. But I think that that's a key thing to keep in mind. And, and Rasmus, you said, when your kids enter your workforce, how do you want your leaders to act? I think that's an interesting one because I was actually mentored when I joined BCG by a senior partner that, that has now left the company and that would tell us, treat your teams as if they were the children of your friends. And I would also leave you with that thought because uh, we all, I mean, some of us have kids, we all know how difficult it is and we still try. Right? So we still try for them because we do care a lot for them. So let's do the same with our teams. We do genuinely care. Let's try and let's be benevolent. As we've all said, I guess we're not trying to be over optimistic, right? There is a lot to be dealt with in the future. There's a lot coming. And all the discussions we have, all of us with, uh, with our, our the companies we're, we're, we're supporting, it's difficult. And we're supporting them in building their path forward. I think you guys said th something that it's important. Let's increase awareness. Let's not be in denial. Let's not be over optimistic, but let's try. It's important to have plans to try and, and to move ahead, test and learn. And I'm sure that if we try all together, we will find a way to actually solve uh, these uh, this challenges ahead. I'm also a great believer that ultimately, this is a big opportunity for all our companies. This is a challenge, <laughs> but uh, as I mean, some of you know, right? The Chinese word for crisis is of course, difficulties, but also opportunities. And, and this is how we need to look at this. This is an opportunity for the company to thrive in the coming years and come bigger and stronger and in a more sustainable way for the coming, for the, for the coming years. So let's openly embrace that challenge. That would be my conclusion. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so um, as we did before, we propose to have a 25 minutes uh, breakout, uh, just to, to be mindful of the time. So um, we will be sent into breakouts. Um, when you receive the prompt, I invite you to, uh, to click on the join breakout to exit the breakouts. Uh, we would very much have a closing word with you. So if you can come back in the plenary, it it's, uh, would be nice. If you don't, then uh, I'll, I'll extend my uh, wishes to um, for, for the good end of the year vacation and for you to get some rest. Uh, there are a few questions here to, uh, to foster a discussion, but uh, usually we, you don't need those questions as a prompt. Um, Rasmus won't be able to join the breakout, but uh, so let me thank you, uh, Rasmus, very warmly for being there with us and for the messages around care and compassion, and also for the great work that you do <laughs> within potential projects to make uh, leaders better version of themselves and to make uh, the world a better place with that. So thank you very much, Rasmus. And um, so much. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Wonderful to meet you. Take care and have a wonderful Christmas break. Yes, and we will read your book uh, carefully. <laughs> um, uh, Juliana, can you send us into the breakout, please? And uh, then we can get going. See you in a minute.